was called a spy, uh, and apparently um, some believe that I worked for Mossad, CIA, and MI6. But I, I was a spy for the academics among the policymakers. And this was in your in Tehran. Right? Yes, I got. I was uh, working at Imperial College of London, and then I got invited by the current government of Iran to go back and serve. And uh, uh, I got arrested up in arrival at the airport. Uh, but but you know, uh, managed to work for a while, going through a lot of chaos. Um, that is still, unfortunately, going on in Iran, and it's getting worse with, with what's happening in, in Washington, D.C. But um, that, that uh, period of working there opened my eyes further. Uh, and the so you were not only accused of being a spy, you were an activist? Yes. I the, the regime thought you were a terrorist. What was your crime? Uh, crime was a, a lot of things that were arguing that um, I keep talking about water shortage uh, with plans to shut down the agricultural sector and make, make the farmers migrate to cities and create another ISIS in Iran and also import GMOs and make the kind of, you know destroy the next generation genetically. So bioterrorist and water terrorist are two two of the titles I carry. Yeah. <laughs> now, now you're in exile. Yeah. Is, is it difficult to really to focus on your research when you're literally sort of running for your life? I mean, I don't want to complain too much. Uh, that that's also helpful uh, to to have have you know, uh, excitement going on. Otherwise, the, world, the life is boring out there, being in, in, in chaos. Uh, but but um, I would say my my research questions have, have fundamentally changed after serving. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let me take you more seriously. Water as a leverage. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the um, invitation. It's it's great to uh, be here, and uh, you know whether water is is, is a leverage a risk, or like you know, uh, I think you can judge after uh, this talk. But um, as a water person, I've always been talking about water shortage, and a term that I, I like to use is water bankruptcy. Um, arguing that the major problem we have in the world that is is that our uh, water demand and use is way more than the renewable rate of, um, of water, um, uh, available water, and, and that causes bankruptcy. And, and the fact that we deny this bankruptcy has an extra cost for us because all of our efforts um, are going into mitigation and, and denying the fact and then not much in adaptation. Uh, if you look at the global, I mean, talking about inequalities and, and we heard what Edgar said. That's a big, big, big problem that we have, uh, not only in human systems, but also natural resources, right? Uh, if you look at um, water use, if they you know, change the map of the world and, and, and the size of countries is pro proportional to their water use, um, Africa is, is, is small. Um, some other parts of the world is, uh, are, are quite big. Some are popular, you know, a lot, have a lot of population, so that's why they're big. Others are big for, for bad use. And, and um, you know, the reason that the global south is small is not because they're not, they don't want to use their water, it's because they, they have what we call uh, some sort of economic water shortage. They don't have the infrastructure in place to use the water. And, and if they did, uh, I, I think, unfortunately, they would have been exhausting the resources as well. Yeah, but but let's let's break this down. If you look at the domestic water use, we see that you know look at the United States, for example, um, with all the innovations, with all the technology improvement, still the country is is quite quite wasteful. Uh, look at Northern Europe, compare that with with India and and, and China. So India and China have a lot of population, but, but Europe is not as populous, but still we have that sort of problem. One more important thing is, is when we compare the industrial water use to agricultural water use. Um, look at this, this map for a second and, and see where, where the, the, the world, you know, which countries look bigger. And now compare this, from this map with this one. The comparison of the two is telling us that the poor countries of the world are providing the food, and the, the, the smart ones or the, the, the development ones are the ones who sell technology and buy food at a very cheap rate. What's sad is that the countries which suffer from water shortage continue to provide food to the rest of the world. 
and, and the poor keep getting poorer and poorer. We have a lot of places on earth that are already suffering from water scarcity, extreme water scarcity. They have problems of, of you know, water shortage continuously reoccurring, and, and we hear all these stories about this city and that city running out of water, this former community and that former community running out of water. Now, in, in the developed world, in, in places with better economy, the economy is resilient enough to tolerate this sort of shortage, but in, 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 in a lot of places, in the weak economies, that's not a possibility. Once you have a shortage, you have a failure of communities, you have migration and so on. And we heard about the expected population growth. Who's going to provide food to this population? Where does that come from? And everyone is, is looking forward to the future development of Africa, and, and we're already counting on their food production. But they also have the huge population growth. And, and then we, we adopt meat, and we want to eat more meat, and meat takes more water. So, so we need more water for food, food production. Also energy, right? We, we hear all these stories about renewables. Who thinks renewables are not thirsty? A lot of renewables are actually very thirsty. So, um, so, so no matter what, what what your plans are, you need more water for even you know energy production. So water, food, energy already. If we think about this nexus, we see how 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 crazy the situation is. The problems of of using too much water, global water bankruptcy, didn't end with the Aral Sea tragedy. The Aral Sea tragedy happened decades ago, and we were familiar with it. But, but we go around the world and see these things are happening over and over, and we just simply don't learn from our mistakes. We keep repeating the same problem. Just recently, like you know, last week, it was all over the news. What, what happened to one of the most populous cities of India? Running out of water. Cape Town was on the, on the news you know, some years ago. Uh, day zero was coming. And, and this thing would, would, would happen in other places on Earth simply because we don't learn about our mistakes, simply because um, the developing world also wants to repeat every problem that was produced in, in the West or, or the more developed countries. As a result, we have this issue of unequal access to water, a lot of communities which suffer from water shortage, privatizing, privatizing the systems didn't work out, um, all the things that we are do, doing are still failing. Um, and, and, and when you're talking about lack, lack of access to water, I mean, a problem that many of us cannot even imagine, right? So a lot of things that we heard about are related to water. Now, if you're talking about SDGs, I think like this, all the 17 goals are also related to water. If they're you know, connected to antibiotics, of course, they are also related to water. And it's, it's true that like every other resource has the same role. So, so, so all these things are happening, and, and the countries are still very much frustrated with, with you know, what they need to do for food, food security, and, and the farmers, and, and water in many countries is a job provider, because your economy is not good, you have to use water to provide jobs to the farmers, because as long as they have a job to do, they're not going to migrate, they're not going to create tension, they're not going to overthrow your regime. So, so water becomes a, a job provider, does what the politicians don't do. And we see more and more lakes going dry, more and more wetlands drying up around the world, just simply the Aral Sea tragedy, Aral Sea syndrome getting repeated. And in, in this century, we will see more of this. This is Lake Rumi in Iran, northwest Iran, the, the, one of the largest uh, hypersaline lakes in the world that just got dried up because people overuse water upstream. With that comes environmental degradation, ecosystem death, and a problem that is getting more and more serious and we still don't pay attention to, it, the problem of dust storms. So when the lakes go dry, when the soil moisture is, rough, is lost, dust is, is moving around. So again, the health issues and the problems of health and you know, shall we have people migrating because of these problems or not? And can we restore these systems? Unfortunately, not in, 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 in a few decades. That's how ecosystems work. So we don't get a chance to re, 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 restore them in a short period of time. And now we know, well, at least in this country, in your neighboring countries, 
you know, while the, the, the Middle Eastern water problems can have consequences for your countries, people who migrate, tensions, wars, and things which are, have, you know, re related to, to water, water systems. So a drought can be a catalyst to a war and tension. And, and, and we hear that about Syria. The problem is not as, 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 as simple as the media likes to tell us, that the drought caused a you know, formation of ISIS, but drought played a role, and that role is important. And what happens in Syria is affecting Scandinavia or the Nordic countries. So some like to, to call it call water shortage as the you know the, the most important problem of, of, of the world or like you know one of the most important risks. But but I think you know we all think about that you know, about the subjects we are working on in the same way. Now to add to this the issue of, of climate change. So if this is the world from 1850s till now, we all have already seen a temp temperature increase. We agree that the world has got warmer. That's something that we know, and that causes extreme events and droughts and, and things like this. We, we managed our system, we, we managed our system, we designed our system based on the historical record, and now all of a sudden we're facing a new situation that we don't know how to deal with, and this is Stockholm. So Stockholm, Boland, Boland Center, has, has records from 1750, so 100 year more data. And, and even in Stockholm, we, we are seeing this sort of trend. When is the last time you have built a reservoir? When is the last time you have made significant changes to the water system? Uh, now, what, what gets us even more confused is that we can, we have a hard time disaggregating the impacts of, of you know, local decisions by the, by the decision makers and by the policy makers and, and, and the global climate change. And, and, and climate change is a gift to many politicians in the developing world because you can blame every problem on climate change. And you, who has caused climate change? The industrial countries, right? So it's a way out for many countries. So now the question is, are we reaching our tipping point? Is the world ending any soon? And, and you know, I'm sorry for not being as positive as the morning speakers. I think we need to be really frustrated. We need to be really, really frustrated about what is happening because tipping points cannot be Tipping points are not easy to predict. You can see the, you know, what, what, you know when, when you see revolutions, coups, and all these like revolutions within human systems, no security agency, no intelligence agency could ever predict uh, any, any of these things happening at, at the time that they happen. Because human systems are, are you know, showing behaviors that we don't understand, and when you combine them with, with natural resource systems, things can get even scarier. And, and, um, your life can be more miserable. But now let's be a little bit positive, yes? So we're in the fourth industrial revolution, and, and we can innovate faster, we can do a lot of things at a much higher speed. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all these cool things that we hear about, and, and you know, see papers left and right, we see startups coming out, emerging, a lot of things are happening. We can measure, we can monitor, we can, we can calculate, and all these things are happening at this time that we, you know, and, and we are very proud of what we are accomplishing as a group in the fourth industrial revolution. But does, this is something that we need to ask ourselves. The fact that we can measure and calculate, does it mean that we can also understand our systems better? Our understanding of the systems keep changing, but our institutions and norms and values not. They're not changing as fast as they should. We still want to economically, you know, find a, an economically justified solution for the global climate crisis. Can we? No, I mean, we have failed so far because the, the existing norms and values have not been designed for the problems that we are having. So we need to be careful with this arrogance that we are developing as a result of you know, industrial revolution, the new industrial revolution, because every industrial revolution, every discovery, antibiotic, whatever, like we have discovered, have also come up with, you know, with some unintended consequences. DDT was the example you used in the morning. I mean, things have not changed. So whatever we do today will also have consequences. And that is probably, you know, no, there's no problem with that. We just have to be careful. But why is that happening? 
because I'm an engineer, so it's, it's, it's okay to be so critical. The, the reason that we, we've, you know, the, the cause of these unintended consequences is the way we have been trained to think and, and solve problems. We see the present problem, we, see, we define the problem, compare like, you know, so we say this is where we want to be, this is where we are, this defines our problem, we come up with our solution, and, and, and then we invent, we, invent, we, we develop, we, we build, and, 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 and all that. What we don't do is thinking about how our product, how our solution might have an impact on the definition of the problem, and what are the unintended consequences of what we are doing. Because every one of us is, has been trained to work in our own sector. I'm a water engineer, all I want to do is to solve the world's water problems or the re regional water problems. So I give you one example of, of a beautiful city of Isfahan in, in Iran, the former capital of Iran, which had water shortage issues. Like other countries, like many other places, what they did was, okay, we have water shortage, but look at look there and there and there. There's some water, so we can't transfer to here. The Americans have done it, the Chinese are doing it today, the you know, Europeans have done it, uh, we're seeing it in Libya, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and all, all over the world, these, these you know, massive water infrastructure water transfer infrastructure. And that's what they did to satisfy their water, you know, water demand of the agricultural sector, the industrial sector, and the urban sector, and also the environmental sector. But this is how the river looks most of the year. This is me on, on the riverbed. And, and we're talking about a city which has its identity tied to the river which is passing through it. So the city is, is dead because of this. Imagine London without things, right? With the dry things. So what happens? And what has happened in this basin is that they have done a lot of water transfer projects. They have implemented a lot. They have more than doubled the natural flow of the river through water transfer. But this is the outcome. Why? Because they didn't consider the unintended consequences. And now what they're dealing with is, is tension and conflicts in the Donor basin and the recipient basin, accusations and a, a lot of things. Pub, the public is angry, strikes and everything is, is happening. And what you, the only thing you can do is to wish for rain and pray for rain. And I was at some point uh, on the committee deciding about our water allegation in that region. It's, it's really tough. What we didn't do as engineers was to think about how our solution might be, uh, cause, cause a new problem. We solved the water scarcity problem, the top loop, through interbasin water transfer. What we didn't pay attention to was how this increase in water availability can promote development in this region and can increase migration in this region because it creates jobs and makes the region attractive. So our problem actually came back at a bigger scale. So the region is thirstier, the agricultural land area has increased. And, and you have more population in the region. So I, this is pretty much what we are doing. I mean, the antibiotic example was the perfect thing for, for here. So you don't think about the resistance and, and what happens and, and, and what the unintended consequences would be. And, and what we do most of the time is, is to cure the symptom, right? So I also use the, the example to um, the drug, drugs example to, to explain this. So if you have pain in your body because of infection and you're taking painkillers, you're just curing the symptom for a few hours. The, the infection keeps getting worse and worse and worse. You need antibiotic, but you're taking painkillers. This is the problem that we have in a lot of, you know, in, in problem solving in, in engineering because we have been trained in a certain way. We're not thinking about the loops and, and, and trade-offs and all these uncertainties and, and, and complexities that we need to deal with. So another thing, whether you call it the wicked problem, super wicked problem, system of systems problem, complex problem, super complex problem, it's the same thing. The only thing to remember is that you know you are solving one problem in one sector, make sure that you you know you're not creating problems elsewhere. So be less arrogant, think about all the complexities and so on. This is a paper I, I, I like, I wrote it with, with a Swedish actually.
co-author um, also a pessimist maybe like me um, so we are de dealing with with you know water systems and, and human water systems once you add human to water system things become m much more more complex because you have to deal with with the bounded rationality issues you you don't have enough data things are non-stationary they are changing um, you have evolutionary behavior because you have humans and 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 you don't have the power to predict and understand everything. So, so you have this issue, and, and my water system is super complex already. But if I, you know, and this is my 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 work. It's like you know, full the full page. But if you look at water within the universe, it's a very small part of the complex systems. Every talk that we heard deserves one circle, you know, different size on this this complex system that water is just a component of and then when it comes to other matters that I talked about so food environment and, and energy they also have their own complexities they also have their own systems they are also run and managed by other people and how do I deal with the trade-offs now the problem is that when, once you're in policy making you're dealing with a lot of other problems too which are quite big and important now the question is whether I want to invest into solving the problems of the future generations, or I want to get reelected. And that's how the real world works, no matter if you're in Sweden or, or, or you know, in the developing world, incentives matter. And that's something that we need to change somehow. Um, now the problem with the water sector is when it comes to prioritization, this is like Eisenhower box, an example of like how you prioritize problems. You have limited resources and limited time. Urgency and importance. Water. Where is water? Water is, is somewhere, you know, depending, like when you compare it to other matters, how important it is even is debatable, but it's not urgent. To make it urgent and, and take it to like prioritize it, we need extreme events. Floods, droughts, crazy things. But they're scary because you know you might, your system might become Cape Town and, and then you save and, and have some permanent benefits from you know Cape Town didn't see its day zero and some some reforms were implemented California other places but you might also get Syria so so your system can be can get out of control now with climate change we have this thing climate change is creating a, a big opportunity for us to implement changes to think differently, to do something. It's a global problem, you know, so, and, and we understand it more than before, and we have talked about it, so people also hear it, and then we have 15 years old and 16, a 16 year old leader who's talking about it, and, and there is a chance to, to do something, but, but we can't only solve this problem when, when we get out of boundaries. I've been negotiating deals, I was, you know, in COP negotiations as, as the, the negotiator for Iran, and when it comes to negotiations, I also care about my national interest and, and, and then who would accuse me of what. And, and, and thinking about national interest and putting it against you know, what's good for the globe, then even though you have that knowledge, your behavior is different because your political incentives matter. And globally, we have not come to a conclusion about how we should move, you know, we transfer this transform this problem, what is the narrative that we have to talk about or we have to sell to people, what is, the, what is this, um, you know, when is the world ending? Is it 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, all these uncertainties that are out there and, and, and they're preventing the policymakers from making a decision and the public just gets confused. Once you get rid of boundaries, once you understand that water it is not only about water, water is, is food, water is energy, water is dignity, water is, is jobs, water is about employment, um, stability, and so on, then there are opportunities for trade, for strategic loss, give and take. And unfortunately, we still don't think that way. We don't solve problems that way. And, and this is the problem that we're having. Because when, it, you know, when we make decisions about energy, the energy sector differently, separately from the water sector. It's good to, to go renewable, but if you want to make the world renewable and you require like 50% more water in the future, tell me where you get that from. So you solve one problem and you create another one.
But again, the positive side is that we can innovate now, we are, we are fast, we are rapid. I, we can't imagine what would be out there in 10 years from now. Fortunately, I think, because then there would be discoveries. Like yesterday was all over the news, what the, the big aquifer they, they found in the ocean off the coast of the United States. And now they're talking if, if this aquifer is, is, is like, you know, taking water out of it is feasible, then that means a lot, like, you know, a lot of solutions for water. So we will have discoveries. That's a good part. The question is whether we can keep up with the problems we have created, whether the institutions which are in place are capable of handling changes, right? Transformation that you talked about, system shifts and trajectories. We don't talk about pathways, we just talk about the ideal solutions. Technologies out of the industrial revolution now allow us to, to measure things, to help people very far from us to understand what is going on. But we just, we should not limit these technologies of measurements and monitoring to gadgets. They have to help us understand systems better. And unless we do that, I, I don't think we can get get anywhere. So, but, but there are positive things. There are positive, you know, opportunities out there which were created by the risk that we, we have had and we, we have failed and we have got stronger and stronger. But one last thing that, you know, I, I should share with you is I was one of those working at the interface of science and policy. But once I became a policymaker, I realized, you know, the, the mis my, my, you know, how much I discounted the power of society and people. The fact, you know, there is a fact that there that, that even dict in dictatorships, you're afraid of the way people think about it. You're afraid of, like, you know, the values of the system systems and people and their thoughts and their narratives. So we, we need to communicate to people directly and change their value system and put more pressure on the shoulders of the policymakers if we want to change.